Welcome back to the Rooted Podcast, where we become more rooted in our faith and we grow together in community. This is week seven of our sermon series, Grit, and I have three guests with me today. I have Brick. I'm going to go for it. Yes. And he is our Crisfield campus pastor. (laughs) And we have Angel with us today from our Bethany campus. Come on. And we have JB, Let's our go. guest speaker. He's not a guest <laughs> to Emmanuel, our Emmanuel family, but we have JB, Justin Barnes, with us as well today to discuss the sermon that he he spoke yesterday. So, welcome everybody. What's up? What's Glad up? Glad to have you all with Pleasure me today. To you know I'm hype. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, just to open us up and get our conversation started, I just thought that um, since we have two of our campus pastors here with us. And um, since you guys, a lot of our, the general public or the general family of our church doesn't get to see you guys a lot, right, yeah. um, I thought you would just kind of share a little bit about how this sermon resonated at your campus yeah. this week. You go for it. You got okay. it first. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, first off, I want to say uh, JB translates very well mm-hmm. online through a video. Good. Um, yeah. And that's something that... <clears throat> As a campus director where we do have a video venue, I appreciate so much. Um, I don't know if that's something that you intentionally have thought about. Uh, It seems like based on our conversations before that you do think about even all the campuses and people watching Mm -hmm. online, but it translates so tremendously where we feel the Holy Spirit and we feel everything that you're talking about so vividly in our campuses. But um, I would say for us, uh, we're in a season in uh, a lot of transition, a lot of Mm -hmm. change, a lot of um, just trying to establish something really good in Chris Field and um, understanding and getting to that certainty that is in Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. is something that is so key for a culture and a community Mm -hmm. that is trying to move forward and make kingdom impact. So it translated so well. We had some great conversations afterwards where people were just talking about maybe seasons in life that they've been in where they just not been certain on Mm -hmm. things or maybe looking for uh, their certainty in things that they shouldn't have. Um, But the reminder that Jesus is the only thing Mm -hmm. certain in every moment of our lives. Mm -hmm. It was a great, great Sunday. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, same, same sort of thing with our campus over there in Bethany. I mean, very different um, community. Still, there's a lot of the same needs. There's a lot of people who are searching in different ways. So, you know, same as what Eric said. I mean, it came through like gold and it struck some people. So, you know, it it makes my job a lot easier for sure. Um, But it was also so cool to see the response from our congregation in a myriad of different ways. So, um, for example, having a call and response moment at the end of service where, you know, we have the opportunity to, to pray from the offset of that message into, okay, you're going to take this with you in your Monday through Saturday. And seeing the hunger of the people in that room was so encouraging to myself, but also it was just incredible to see that people just, they know that they need something. And just like Brick said, and just like you said, the certainty is in Jesus. So we appreciate you. You're are a legend, of course. So, yeah. <laughs> you again, you make our job easy. So yeah, that's yeah. O- that's overly generous. I just want to recognize you two and your work uh, on the front line, serving the people. It's one thing to stand up on a stage, but pastoring is much bigger than being a speaker. Absolutely. And uh, what Pastor Mark does, what you all do, uh, that's pastoring. And so, I just want to honor you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to speak at all to our central campus here and just the response that you you saw? Yeah, I just uh, number one. Being able to speak here is such a gift. Uh, There's very few houses uh, of worship that have such a diverse group. And so the response is varied across uh, the way the campus responds. And so it's it's just so rich and rewarding to be in that environment and see the various ways in which Mm -hmm. people respond, whether it be to worship uh, or whether it be to the Word. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I try to do as I prepare is I try to think specifically about the people to whom I'm speaking. Right. Yeah. And I try to consider what is that single mom who is up against it? What is she feeling? What is she going through? What is she thinking? Mm-hmm. I try to think about the person who, you know, I talked to these guys about it. The, the Lord revealed to me um, regarding about orphans. Well, 
some people are spiritually orphaned. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that mm -hmm. while they may have a family, do they have that spiritual family? Right. right. And so you, you try to think about that person who um, has come from that home that didn't have the background mm -hmm. to bring them up in their faith. Yeah. Uh, you try to try to really see it from the person's perspective that is just uh, on day one of having gone three years sober, and then they just blew their sobriety, and they've stumbled into church just looking for some type of hope, some type of reason right. to not feel ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And so you try to take on all these different uh, considerations as far as their perspective in your preparation right. Right. so that you can speak to them uh, as one with empathy, mm. right. uh, not as one with judgment and condemnation and shame and let me show you how smart I am. No, let me serve you. Right. Right. Let right. me Come show on. you the portions of the gospel that were written for you to encourage you and right. to invite you to turn back. Yeah. Uh, so that that's uh, that, that's what I love about our church, mm. you know, because I think we have that wide array of people who are represented in the congregation with yeah. various experiences and backgrounds. And so speaking to that wide range of people, God's word is so good and so rich mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it is it is able to speak to each one of those unique uh, personalities right. and experience groups yeah. uh, and do so with such great impact. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's so, so good. Mm. So good. <clears throat> Can I just say real quick? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to interject. Um for those of you who heard his message yesterday and maybe thought about his vocabulary being so amazing, <laughs> uh, because I think about it all the time, uh, just know that JB talks like this all the time. This yeah. is this <laughs> is not a, just a stage thing. It's not a, a podcast thing, but JB just has an amazing vocabulary that, w that we get to experience because we have personal relationships with him. But yeah, yeah. just kind of wanted to interject that because well, i just you. bro he's you're amazing it. for yeah. it he's got i, like I want to be like you when i grow up <laughs> <laughs> that's very generous thank you <laughs> well you had some awesome sermon props this week too and um i loved how you used the it's an old school vacuum right how, oh, I mean, yeah. how old are we talking because i'm like i remember that vacuum well but. kenmore was a sears brand okay Jeez. angel do you even know what sears is I think I've seen it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, there, there's some context for you. So Kenmore was a Sears brand. So I would say that that would have been early 90s. Okay. Now, mm. was this vacuum up in your attic or was this from mom's or? This vacuum was in mom's attic okay. and it was representative of the image for which I was searching, was searching. but yes. was unable to find. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I loved it. I loved that, that illustration. I thought that... Um, it would resonate with everybody because we all have an image in our mind of what mm. is familiar. Um, and the fact that what you were looking for, you know, was that image. And so your first point um, yesterday was the search. Um, and you really talked about how, um, well, the, the scripture, the actual context was the uh, Jewish Christians were under persecution um, and we've talked about that all throughout this series. Right. Yeah. Um, and yet it relates. So, and, and pretty much it's just a constant reminder of, you know, keep the course, right. stay the course, you know, don't give up, don't turn back. Um, which is kind of where we went, where you went on Sunday with this message. Um, and so you were talking about the search and searching for certainty and how we in our own lives, you know, we're faced with a crisis or, uh, an urgent situation where the level of fear is very high. Right. And oftentimes we look or we turn to what's familiar. Um, so just to start us off specific to the sermon, um, when faced with crisis or an urgent situation, um, why are we tempted to search for certainty in the form of familiar? Why do wow. you think that is? I, I know I question. go right in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I go it. right in. No, it's amazing. Uh, I think... In the season of life that I'm in right now, uh, specifically talking about just like emotional and mental health, um, season I'm going through and growth, uh, going to therapy, going to a counselor, mm -hmm. for me, super important. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been talking about is that cycle of familiarity mm -hmm. is something that our, that our brains mm -hmm. just automatically drive us to. Yeah. Right. So no matter what, even if... Sorry, this is just unconsciously happening. Actually, our brains do right, this. Right, right. 
I don't have to think about it. My brain just automatically takes me to something that I'm familiar with mm -hmm. because the uncertainty seems so much scarier. Yeah. Because there's so many other options right. versus the one thing I may actually be familiar with, even though it may hurt, mm -hmm. even though it's it it just sucks, honestly. Yeah. But it's what my brain wants to do because it doesn't know anything else. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just like, let me just go to the one thing I know, right? even though in the end I know it's going to hurt me. Yeah. But I know the outcome of that. I know it's going to hurt, right. but then, you know, we'll just look for something else to kind of bring me back to that. Right. But the in, in the uncertainty, there's just an infinite amount of outcomes that can come from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think even just on the same, like, I guess, scientific lens that you can look at it, your your brain also makes neuro pathways, and that's mm. like you can kind of see it as an image of somebody that's walking in a field. If you walk mm -hmm. up and down, yeah. up and down, it's gonna have the footpath right. that you've been walking. Yeah. And for many people, you know, ourselves included, we've walked a path mm -hmm. for a long time mm -hmm. in our life. Whether it's coping mechanisms with certain crises that come up, or mm. if it's you know, I don't know, you fill in the blank. Yeah. But what's really really cool is we can actually unlearn and then relearn. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can unlearn and walk right. a new different pathways. path. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One that is positive. It's like right. creating new habits. And, you know, Justin is a habits mastermind, I'm convinced. <laughs> but <laughs> truthfully, being able to understand that there is a lot that obviously we can't control in right. uncertainty, mm -hmm. but there is a level of control that we do have. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what are the habits that we've put in place? What, mm -hmm. are the, what are the pathways that we're walking right. and changing from what they may have been in our familiar past? So yeah. there's things that we can do, but there's certain things that obviously we can't control. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's so much easier because that path is already set versus having to create a new path, you right. have to work. Mm -hmm. right. There's lot more effort involved in that rather than just walking the same path that we've already right. created there's a rut there right and we're just okay with just getting in that rut again yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah in regards to searching for certainty uh in that point i want to start with being clear that it's very very important that we study god's word from the perspective of the recipients of the text right mm -hmm. mm what was going on and what were they experiencing. And yeah. so that, that needs to be the way we really uh, ingest yeah. the Word of God so that we can really understand the context and not, uh, like a lot of Facebook memes and different things, take something out of context right. yeah. just because it makes for a great soundbite. Right. Yeah. And so I started there with this point. Mm -hmm. But what I typically do is then say, okay, now that I know the temperament or the feeling or the season in which the audience is in, right. because they're human just like I'm human, what are the portable feelings that transcend time mm -hmm. right. and allow me to tap into the applicable principle that would apply to them, but also to me mm. without misrepresenting the word? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's good. Absolutely. So in their case, you know, they're... They're tempted to search for certainty in the form of familiar, meaning let's go back to the law. Oh, let's go back to yep. the sacrificial yep. system. Let's right. go back to the Levitical priesthood. Right. Let's go back to that. Right. And when faced with similar circumstances of uncertainty, we do the same thing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We want to go back to the thing that gave us comfort. We cling to the comfort mm -hmm. of familiar, yeah. right. mm -hmm. even at the expense of a superior solution. Right. right. Even at the expense of what's better. I think the text there said that the old of the law was weak and useless mm -hmm. comparison to this better thing, right. Right? Mm -hmm. this better option that God had given us. Yeah. And I wonder how often we cling to comfortable mm -hmm. at the expense of God's very best for our life. Right, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. That's really good. Ish. Yeah, and I think sometimes we, what's familiar, usually based on our upbringing, it's not what, um, not you, not always the best thing right. <laughs> that we yeah, turn absolutely. back to. I was yeah. just thinking about um, how, just sharing from personal um, and thinking about your message, how, I mean, com comfortable is exactly what I go back to, um, which always leads to complacency. Yep. Mm. And um so that's been something that God has, is constantly working on me with to make sure when I feel the pressure of something or it gets too hard or um, 
or it's just, yeah, I can't see the way forward that I go back to what's comfortable. And, um, I think a lot of that was established in me because my younger years, I grew up moving constantly. Right. I mean, with being a mission missionary family, um, I think it was my was it my first grade year that I went to four different, three or four different schools, just elementary schools that um, one year, um, and then living in all different places from Charlotte, North Carolina, to going out to Missouri, to living up in Pennsylvania, and then we went overseas. Um, and so just that um, constant change, change of environment, change of culture, right. change mm-hmm. of friends and people that we're around has set me kind of on this course. And even though it's been really good for me, there are things and pathways and all that have been created because of that. And right. so I just crave the comfort when things get difficult. So would anybody else, I mean, I know Eric shared a little bit, but anybody else want to share just personally um, how you tend to move back to or turn back to what's familiar? I think personally I I find myself busying myself up. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes that looks like um, it's almost like throwing a, a cape over like, dirty dishes or whatever Mm. that's kind of it's a silly image but what i think of it's almost like if i can distract myself enough then what is the main thing doesn't have to be the main thing right now Mm. whatever issue i might be dealing with doesn't have to be you know we don't need to nip that in the bud right right now yeah but what happens is the longer you cover up those dishes in the stink in the sink the more they start to stink so what i've started to realize is when it when faced with adversity rather than busying myself up and distracting myself from whatever issue may need the most attention and looking elsewhere let's just grow up and Mm -hmm. let's take it on Mm -hmm. let's figure it out however long it takes let's figure it out let's take care of it so that way again it's it's re re reimagining what that pathway Mm -hmm. looks like Mm -hmm. for my life i don't want to be the man that puts it aside for another day, whatever the issue may be, big or small, right. but rather, if I can, let's do this thing now. So that way, down the road, we don't have to worry about it becoming something bigger. Thing. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. I would, I would also add that um, as I've matured as a follower of Christ, mm-hmm. going back decades now, I certainly had habits mm-hmm. that I would return to yeah. uh, in the form of familiar in my search for certainty. Uh-huh. I'm thankful to have had to have gone through those habits because the level of empathy that gives me mm-hmm. for someone who is struggling with something similar mm-hmm. uh, is, is very powerful and allows me a level of connectivity uh, to folks uh, that is just is, is beautiful and rich. Mm-hmm. But what I'd say as I've been maturing is that I, I have a tendency now in times of crisis, uncertainty, chaos, f- fear, fatigue, to possibly look for certainty in the form of a familiar story. So we've never done anything without first thinking it. Yeah. And so if you can find the right story to validate the right action, mm. then you've already lost mm. or right. won. Mm. Follow the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think I've had to learn to uh, essentially take every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ and asking simply, is this a true thought? Right. Mm. Is this true? Because often some of the thoughts that uh, make way for shame in our lives or give us permission to live short of the standard that God has invited us to, particularly as men. I think this is something we do. Absolutely. That started as a story. Mm -hmm. And so I find that in in times of failure in particular, or times of fatigue, uh, man, there is is an illusion of certainty in a familiar story. Mm -hmm. You can put it on like a well-worn jacket, and you can kind of hide in it like it's camouflage. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But after a while, it becomes real uncomfortable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good. All right. Well, let's move on to your second point, sifting. Mm, the that's sifting. my favorite point. This is my that's favorite point. That's your favorite one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, that's my that story. You said that there's certainty in sifting seasons, and you took us to Luke 22 um, about Peter. And um, you talked about how sifting, it removes what is un- unusable to keep what is most useful. And you talked about the wheat and the chaff. And um, I was thinking about some of the other other metaphors that are used in Scripture. Um, 
just the refining seasons, the fire that refines us um, to remove the sediments and purifies us would be another. And then also just John 15, too. I think we talked about a couple weeks ago about how he cuts off every branch in us um, that bears no fruit. And right. so there's several different metaphors that are used in regards to the sifting season. Um, and good old Peter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what has a sifting season look like for you? This was a challenging message, yeah. <laughs> encouraging <Absolutely>. yet challenging. <laughs> Self-inflicted season of sifting. Yeah. There's some alliteration for yeah. you. Yes, yeah. there you go. Self-inflicted season of sifting. And what does that look like? Do you think that every season of sifting we go to is self-inflicted? That's a question that I had as well. Actually, is that really? for me? Yes, I'm asking you. Uh, I've asked myself this question, and I don't know if it's because I, I believe in a high degree of personal responsibility. Okay. Uh, I tend to find that if I identify any season in my life as a sifting season and I trace that back to a decision, typically I knew that I was making a poor decision or a decision that was in conflict with my identity as a Christ follower. Mm -hmm before okay. experiencing that season. Right. Do I think that every season that could be qualified as a sifting season in everybody's life is self-inflicted? No. But in my own experience, right. maybe I'm just super good at making bad choices. Uh, most of my self most of my seasons of sifting have been self-inflicted. Okay. Yeah. yeah for that, sure. that makes sense. I had the image of in uh, Matthew 3, I believe, but John the Baptist is, you know, continuing to make the way for the coming Messiah, mm -hmm. and says that he is coming with a fork to do the work of okay. sifting and to clearing the threshing floor right. of the chaff and separating it from the wheat. So I see Jesus as like, kind of as you've said, whether it's self-inflicted, in most cases, there is an impurity that Jesus has to sift out of our life in order to take what was meant for good right. and make it good. So ultimately for my own life, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of not even realizing, and you could also trace it back to what it, what it, what had I learned even in my childhood mm. that then carried over into my adulthood that I never let go of habits or, you know, whatever the case may be. And then when the sifting happens, it hurts a lot. But it is so freeing to walk in. It's it's like I think of a dog being groomed mm. and like the excess fluff is getting taken off. And I can only imagine how free they feel, especially in the mm. hot Salisbury <laughs> yeah, summer. That's right. Um, <laughs> that's how it feels, truthfully, like to be able to walk in true liberation, which Jesus promises. Yeah. I mean, it is for freedom that he set us free. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that this sifting has such a potential to free us is so incredible and it's been you know the testimony of my life even sitting here right now yeah it's incredible yeah that's great to give you another since we needed another analogy i love it uh <laughs> i'm often aware that when you go for an mri mm -hmm. they're like is there any metal in your body you know is there an, and i'm like well what would happen you know and it's that super strong magnet i mean mm -hmm. in my mind i'm like that magnet's gonna rip the metal out of me right <laughs> yeah. i often see the process of sanctification like this supernatural MRI. Mm -hmm. mm. By any means necessary, God's going to remove whatever needs to come up out of our lives. Yeah. And it can be as hard as it needs to be. Right, yeah. absolutely. I would prefer in this season to release it to Him mm -hmm. as opposed to have it ripped, ripped from me. Yeah. Right. But I do find that in this season, it's very... When, when you first uh, begin to follow Jesus Christ, uh, in my experience the obvious habits you begin to be convicted of because you're so hyper aware of them, but you're also aware that everybody else is aware of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they are kind of the low hanging fruit, if you will, that goes first. Mm. Then all of a sudden the things that you've clung to and done a real good job of hiding, right. the self-inflicted sifting is mm -hmm. where I'm going yeah. here. Okay. The things that you've clung to that can be kind of done in secret where other people might not see them mm -hmm. or they're a little easier to conceal or they're that really special thing that you just don't want to give to God. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, by any means necessary, it's going to be ripped away from you. Mm -hmm. right. And so that sifting can be as violent as is necessary right. so that what remains is the highest and best use of the vessel. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. 
that's the beauty of the sifting process. And right. I left out a scripture yesterday, but I think it's chapter six of Amos where God speaks to the prophet and he says, not a pebble will hit the ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That violent shaking is going to happen. Yeah. You're going to need that season of sifting, mm-hmm. but nothing that I have set apart, says the Lord, is going to hit the ground. Yeah. And man, I'm encouraged by that yes. yeah. because Absolutely. man, I, I am uncertain in seasons of sifting. Mm-hmm. I'm uncertain of myself. Mm-hmm. 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 But I am certain of my Savior. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So great. That's so good. Sheesh. I think even just um, talking about Luke 22, that where he said, it, he didn't say, if you turn back, but when you turn back. <laughs> yeah. um, that gets yeah. me fired up every yeah, time I yeah. read that, that passage. Um, and just the, the assurance that, you know, he is an interceding on our behalf. He right. is, walk, you know, we are walking through this process, but ultimately, you know, he knew that he was going to build his, you know, church on the rock yeah, on Peter. Right, um, yeah. And I think you presented the question, would Peter have been prepared to preach at Pentecost if it wasn't, uh, or if it hadn't been for the sifting seasons? Mm-hmm. And I think we can look at all, all of our lives and those sis- or sifting seasons that have brought us to a place where God, you know, walked us through that, removed things, purified us, sanctified us to get us to the place where he right. can use us, use us, excuse me. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Really good stuff and encouraging. You might have me crying if I talk too much about this one. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) But, um, I want to be clear to the listeners and viewers, as far as the theme of chapter seven, intercession is the theme. Right. Okay. Certainly there's a lot. I mean, we can go deep, uh, when it comes to Melchizedek and some other things, (laughs) Right. but what I hope everyone took is that Jesus lives he didn't live and die. Yeah. He lives yes. Right. Yes. to infinitely intercede for us mm. yes. so that when we have turned back, yes. meaning that when I was living a double life, when what I said didn't match how I lived, yeah. he had already gone ahead of me mm-hmm. and intervened on my behalf yeah. such that when I turned back, he still had a path towards purpose for me and still saw me as useful yeah even though I was a walking contradiction to the redemptive work he wanted to do in my life. Right. Right. Yeah. When you take hold of that truth, Mm -hmm. you operate different. Yeah, absolutely. The confidence and certainty with which you can speak to people about your faith and their faith and about Jesus Christ is different because you would never understand the sufficiency of true grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah had you not realized that in your lowest moment, full well knowing that you would go through that low moment, Jesus said, oh no, I'm going to intervene while you're being sifted yeah. so that I can stabilize your life on the back end of this thing and point you back towards your port of purpose. Mm. I mean, that, that is just an unbeatable truth. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Undefeated. It is. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Um. Yeah, the self-inflicted season of sifting, mm-hmm. right? That's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, big, big theme in my life. I would say ever since I truly started taking my walk with Christ seriously. Mm-hmm. I've, growing up in the church for my whole life, learned a lot of things, a lot of habits, a lot of um, beliefs that weren't necessarily wrong, but I don't believe they were God Mm -hmm. beliefs, God ordained things that I needed to know in my life. And so when I finally took hold of, okay, I am going to be an apprentice of Jesus. How, what does it look like to be an apprentice of Jesus? It completely shifted everything. So now my, I would say past at least three, four years minimum have been unlearning so Mm -hmm. many things that I was taught or Mm -hmm. that I thought I was taught. And learning the ways of Jesus. Yep. And I think most people can say if if they're taking their walk with Jesus seriously, it's almost like a consistent theme. Mm-hmm. Because we will be learning things and we will be finding out things that we may have experienced at some point or maybe someone taught us at some point uh, where when we're with Jesus, he reveals those things to us. Because right. a lot of those yeah. times those things go just underneath the surface. We don't even realize those are thought patterns that we have 
But when we begin to think about what we think, mm-hmm. we're truly able to examine that and put that to the word yeah. right. and compare that to the truths of the the word of God. And that that's a big part of my life now uh, where I am going through that sifting season and it hurts. Yeah, It hurts a lot because it goes against so much of what you think is right, you mm-hmm. think is true. Mm-hmm or you think should be happening. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I was wrong. I was wrong. And in the best way, because that's when you lean on the certainty of Christ. Mm-hmm. Because it hurts. Going through that fire hurts. Getting that sifting done, like the brick on the on the <laughs> grail, the great thing. Like that's not that doesn't feel good. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that's because there's impurities that the Lord is taking out of you. But your mind has to be set on him because if you're set on on the sifting, you're not going to last long. Yeah. But you set your mind on him and you understand, hey, there's this pain, this suffering right. and these problems and trials that are, will arise out of this that will ultimately lead to God bringing something new out of this. God bringing something good out of, out of all of this. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Very good. Well, JB if there is anything else that you wanted to share from just briefly, because I think we're almost out of time, but if there's anything that you briefly wanted to share that you were not able to share on Sunday, I will be very brief. Um, You know, I was struggling with whether or not to include the mention of Melchizedek, Mm -hmm. but I think the mention is noteworthy and I would encourage our audience to study it independently and see where he shows up, particularly uh, in uh, Genesis. Mm -hmm. And just to understand that, What made uh, Melchizedek unique is that he was both a king and a priest. Mm -hmm. And Melchizedek did not, uh, there was no other mention of him, so we don't know where he came from. Mm -hmm. But the Bible's clear, if another came in the order of Melchizedek, that that would essentially be the fulfillment of the law. Right. And so here's Jesus who doesn't come from the right tribe to be a priest. Here's Jesus who's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he's both the infinite intercessor like a priest, yeah. and he has the authority of a king. Right. And I can't think of a more trustworthy person to mm-hmm. hand over your life to. Yeah. And uh, so I was just very encouraged by uh, the mention of Melchizedek there, and I think there's something there for your uh, listeners and our, our watchers to uh to really lean into and study there because it's actually very beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah, you ended with with the source and that he is our source, mm-hmm. and I think that's where we can end. Would you close us in prayer? Happy to. Yeah. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this community and thank you for Emmanuel Church engaging everyone everywhere and with this podcast by every means yeah. necessary, God. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you, God, that we have the ability to share your truth in so many different ways, and Lord, we pray that the the truth of this scripture would go out and would confront the hearts of those who've heard this message, that uh, it would bring about life change, that it would bear fruit. Perhaps there are some that have, like Peter, have turned away, have gone back to that which is familiar. Mm -hmm. God, I pray they'd be encouraged that they would turn back and that they would trust that there's one who lives to intercede yeah. on our behalf, yeah. that no one is too far gone. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for encouraging our hearts with that word. Yeah. Thank you for this community. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.